Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody can hear me clearly. Um, hi, well, let's just um, welcome everybody to the first of the Exmouth Estate digital public consultations. Um, obviously, some of you may remember back in February, we had our first consultation when we were able to meet face to face. Um, but today, obviously, we're having to do this online. Um, obviously, we would have liked to meet, um, come along again and talk to everybody face to face. But today, we're going to talk online and talk through basically what's been happening over the last nine months um, since we started um, work on this. Um, and particularly running through the what we've been doing, talking with the local residents, um, finding out people's opinions and how that started to inform the design that we're putting together. So should we move on? Right, so just so everybody knows, I'm sure everybody does know anyway, but um, the vision from SWAN is to create approximately 250 new homes on this site. Um, now alongside that, there's going to be some new community facilities, which are possibly new shops, um, new, um, when we say community facilities, doctor surgery, a nursery, um, things like that. But we'll come on to that in much more detail later on. And one of the things you'll hear me talking about a lot today is the green space and what we're planning to do with the green space, because we'll come on to this in a lot more detail. As we've been talking to people, it's become more and more apparent to us how important the green space is to the estate. Um, we've divided this up into three sections uh, to make it easy to understand and easier for me. Um, first of all, it's a, just a little introduction to the site, how we've been talking to people up until now, the cons consultations, and basically what we happened at the last time we all met, um, the last major exhibition. And the second chapter is basically just giving everybody a summary of what we've learned over the last nine months talking to people and how that's going to inform how we take the design forward. And then the final chapter is to give everybody a sense of how we've interpreted those ideas and what um, our initial thoughts are, just to give everybody a sense of how the scheme is moving along. Okay, so chapter one, let's just go to the site. Okay, I hope everybody can see this clearly. Now, I want to make this quite clear, the area that we're actually talking about. The site that when we talk about the site, it's the area contained within the red line. I hope you can all make out the red line um, that Patrick's carefully drawing around for us at the moment. That is the area that we're talking about. And so everything that we're talking about today is contained within that line. We're not straying outside that line. Now, the blue line is the extent of the entire estate. And as you can see, there's two orange squares uh, marked on there. And these are areas which are outside our site as well. And so these pieces we won't be looking at. So it's basically everything within the red line is the area that we're gonna be talking about today. Okay. So let's just talk about how we've gone about this process. Um, as a lot of you probably know, we've been talking to people since the beginning of the year. Um, We've had some, we had our first consultation event in February, which hopefully some of you came along to. But the other thing that's happened is a residence steering group has been formed. People are invited to come along. And what we've done over the past year is spoken to this group of people at quite length on very specific topics. Um, so we can get a better sense of people's concerns and worries and priorities for the site. Um, this is a brilliant thing for us. We find it really, really helpful to talk to people and to have an opportunity to talk to people in depth is really helping to inform what we're doing. And you know, it really helps us to understand what people are, the priorities for the site are. Um, and we'll just whiz through some of the things that we've been talking about um, coming forward. And um, we've talked about specific things, um, non-residential uses, car parking, um, landscaping and heights and things like that. But we'll talk about that in more detail as we go along. Okay, and then just a little recap on the last time that we were able to meet um, at the first public consultation event we had in February, um, which was great. People came along, we got a chance to meet everybody. Um, what was good about this was that um, I think, if I remember rightly, 126 people attended over the two days that we did it. And generally, I think that most people, I think it was about 90% of people actually thought and agreed that the regeneration of the estate or the redevelopment of Brayford Square and the associated landscaping work, which was going to be to everybody's benefit, was going to be a real um, asset to this um, estate. And generally people were in favour of it. So that was a really good thing to find out that day. 
So let's move on. Okay, let's start talking about um, the vision for the estate and what we're looking to do and what we've been talking about. So these next few slides that we're going to talk about are things that we've been learning about from people and real concerns. So some of these things might sound a bit obvious, but they're, they're really good to find out. Um, so we had to understand the site and how people use the site at the moment and what's important to people. And one of the things which might sound a bit obvious, but it, we really need to know these things, is where do people enter the site? How do people move around? What how do people feel about coming at these points? Are people, do they think they're good places to come in? So we've been looking at how people move around the site and how this might influence where and what type of things we put on the site. Um, one of the big problems or one of the big issues that people talk about a lot is car parking. What's going to happen with car parking? Because potentially when you hear the idea that 250 new homes might be placed on this site, people immediately think, blimey, there's going to be a lot more cars turning up. That's not going to be good. Um, so obviously we need to start thinking about this very early on. And what we are doing is working to what we call a zero car parking um, scheme where we won't be increasing lot, we won't be providing lots of new car parking. We will obviously be reproviding the existing car parking and um, there'll be additional car parking for blue badge holders, which we, we have to provide and obviously we should be providing. Um, now, the other thing is people have been concerned about is particularly Summer Court Road. If there are new, a lot more cars coming into the site, isn't that going to be a problem for the residents on Summer Court Road or people nearby that potentially we're going to be creating rat runs and there's going to be more traffic? So obviously, we're going to have to look at how we manage traffic coming into the site and where potentially we could make new entrances to make sure that Summer Court Road doesn't suffer or the residents aren't impacted by any additional cars. So we've been doing a lot of work talking to people about cars. Um, and we were also leading on to that. We've been thinking about what about let's making a new access point, potentially from Commercial Road, where we can enter the site, which is going to have very little impact on the existing residents. Um, car park, um, cycle parking. Cycling, obviously, is very important. It's becoming more and more important and more people are cycling. So cycle parking and the provision for cyclists is becoming much more important when designing new estates and so we've obviously got to have that in mind and then the final thing is some residents are obviously very concerned about existing garages on the site and how are we going to maintain access to those so we've been doing work on this as well okay so we'll just quickly run through car parking because i know car parking is a major issue for a lot of people We've talked about, and we spoke with the resident steering group at the great length of this, we had a whole session on this, um, car parking. There's three types of car parking that we've looked at. The first condition on the left-hand side, probably everybody understands, it's, it's normal everywhere. Parking on the street. Okay, we can do that. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this isn't a good idea. One, it, it uses up a lot of land and we, as we come on to, we'll want to maintain as much green space as possible on the site and it's less secure, but on the upside, it's really easy to do. From a construction side, it's, it's relatively economic, but obviously it's not necessarily the best thing for the site and the residents. The second option is what we call a podium scheme, which is sort of like parking on the street, but with basically with a sort of roof over the top of it, which then can become a garden, which has the benefit that it's relatively easy to build. Um, it's less efficient in terms of land. And there is this perceived idea that perhaps a garden on the roof isn't really accessible to everybody. And we'll come on to this. One of the things which is really important to us is to make sure that the whole of the new landscape is accessible to everybody. So the final option is a basement car park. Now, we, like I said, we spoke at great length about this with the residents um, steering group. And actually, this was the preferred option. Um, Obviously, there is a concern about basement car parkings when people think of a traditional, badly maintained, badly lit um, basement car park, which doesn't feel secure and feels like a place where perhaps it might be a place for antisocial behaviour. But when done properly, actually, a basement car park is very secure, very safe. They, um, and there's lots of examples of how to do it properly. And perhaps in this situation, this might be a good thing to do because it means that there's less cars visible on the surface and that we get to maintain the amount of green space. 
Okay, oh, and the other thing that we've been talking about is, okay, car parking is something which is current, but we've got to think forward. What else is going to happen? Perhaps, so we've asked people to talk about, think about other things that we need to think about when we talk about transport. So perhaps carpools, obviously we've got to have to provide a lot more electric charging points and we're going to have to provide a lot of bike storage because people are going to start cycling a lot more. And then obviously we're open to any other suggestions. So we've been asking people, how, what do they think about this? Okay. Right. The other things that we've been talking about is just, we'll come up with a lot of slides like this, what you've got at the moment and what we're thinking could be an alternative. So access. As you enter the site at the moment, you've got a lot of these tarmac roads, hard surfaces, which actually feel a bit inhospitable um, and they're a bit um, not necessarily pedestrian friendly. And we want to change that. We want to move it the other way and make all the open spaces feel much more friendly, much more accessible to people. And where you've got routes across sites, much more legible. So you know where you're going and it's easier to see. And these, these um, the surfaces can be much better that um, level all level surfaces easy for people who um, have trouble moving about um, easier for elderly people to move about and obviously these spaces become well lit and secure so since they're well lit there's less chances um, for antisocial behavior there as well okay now this is quite important to us, the non-residential uses we spent a while talking to people for trying to find out what are the important things what do people use in on the site at the moment and it's very obvious um, that the nursery the gp surgery pharmacy um, things like that are actually really important and they form part of the things which make up the community and obviously we're quite it's important to maintain that community and so we've been looking at okay these are the things on the site at the moment how can we re-provide them within our building or the buildings that we're thinking of putting on the site and where should they go okay and just in the way we think about this um, obviously on the left hand side this is the existing condition i'm sure everybody's very familiar with this view um, perhaps you might say that the buildings are a little bit um, not very welcoming they're a little bit um, not very clear what they are so obviously we want to make sure that what we put back is of a better quality everything we're trying to do is to make sure the spaces we provide are of a much better quality and just on the right hand side there's some examples of community spaces that we've recently done um, i think the top one's actually Aberfeldy. Um, so it's all about how can we make what you've got we provide it at a better as a better quality product um, and a better quality space should i say okay all right now let me just explain something here we fair to you'll hear me talk about this so let's just make sure everybody understands what i'm talking about um the basketball court that currently exists on the site is very important there's no doubts about that and to provide large outdoor spaces where people can um, play is really really sort of fundamental now perhaps the basketball court as it is at the moment it isn't an asset or something that everybody can use or everybody feels they want to use and so we're thinking well perhaps maybe we replace the basketball court somewhere else within the scheme but as what we call a MUGA which stands for a multi-use games area and that's a space where um, different sports can be played by different age groups in a secure well-managed space so it's much more um, friendly to users and it's uh, has a much better um, variety of people who can use it throughout the day doing different things so perhaps you, you know it's basketball football um, for different age groups walking football things like that so it's a space which is an asset for everybody and also it means that it becomes well maintained secure and an asset to the community okay right now this is really important this bit the public realm and the site as it stands at the moment one of the brilliant things about the Exmouth estate and it's a sort of quite a luxury in a way is you've got a very large amount of um, green area with existing trees which is a great thing to have in London and we're obviously it's very important to us to maintain the green space on the site um, 
And if we just, we've I sort of identified problems and things that we can fix. At the moment, the site has, there's uneven paving, there's tarmac roads, there's pinch points. And because the site is relatively open to commercial road, it actually is quite susceptible to pollution coming in from commercial road. And these are things that perhaps we can fix going forward in, with our new design. So we're very, we're gonna be very careful about the green space overall, the trees are very, very important to us, and we'll talk about those in a bit more detail. How we deal with the planting and how we deal with the recreation spaces, these are all things that we are really helping, are beginning to inform what we're doing. Okay. If we look at the image on the left, this is obviously the existing, what you've got at the moment, and perhaps you could say that it's not the best example of planting and seating. Um, and there's other things that we can do instead. So what we're looking to do is as a holistic approach to the landscape of the overall site, not but contained within the red line. Um, so that's what we're talking about, the area within the red line. Talking about the landscape as a holistic thing, what can we do to improve it for everybody? And perhaps rather than having, um, you know, these blank planters and planters with just trees remaining in them, that we can look to create a much better landscape, which gives ev everybody a really good green space to look into. We can start making different spaces which appeal to different people, you know, different age groups. There's places for people to sit, places for people to meet and chat, and then there's spaces for people to play. And the landscape becomes an absolute integrated thing, which helps tie together the existing buildings and the proposed new buildings. OK. And then just to, touching on landscape in general, and I think we sort of covered a couple of these points. A lot of Brayford Square at the moment, or the majority of it, is covered with what we just call a hard surface, which here it's a collection of bricks, paving, tarmac, and it's a bit uneven and it's not necessarily the easiest thing to move around. So what we look to do is to make the landscape as visually appealing, to look as nice as possible for everybody, and at the same time work really simply and functionally and create paths which are easy to move across, spaces, like I said, well lit, and also start introducing um, a variety of surfaces and a variety of plants to make it much more interesting. And um, one of the things that obviously we will talk about in landscape a bit more is that by designing a landscape properly, we can make sure that we design it in a way which is, even though it, it's a beautiful landscape, it's a low maintenance landscape. So it's not going to go off and it won't um, deteriorate over the years. In fact, it will get better and better and better as the estate ages. OK, and that's what coming on to this, actually. So what we've got at the moment, you have you do actually have a lot of green space, which is an absolute brilliant thing. And it's a huge asset that you've got. But perhaps it's not being used to its best potential. Um, and you've just got big areas of grass with some trees in it. Now, what we're thinking, like I say, is to start introducing a lot more planting and a lot more um, diverse planting and seasonal planting and things like that, which helps to um, make the place just just look better and more visually appealing for everybody so it's it's not just an asset to wander around it's something which is nice to look at for everybody throughout the whole year and one of the things particularly about trees is that you've got great trees on the site and the trees really are something which really helps to define the sense of community um, the sense of the space I should I say and so it's important for us to say okay let's try and maintain the trees and um, so we are being um, careful to make sure that we maintain the trees and where possible we're going to try and save every tree on the site if we can't if there's some ones that we can't then what we'll ensure is that mature trees are planted back on the site instead so there will be like for like if not a net gain in trees okay Right, I'll quickly run through the proposals. This is, this is what we've learned. This is where we're starting to gather the information from everybody that we've learned over the last nine months. Okay, so let's just talk quickly about how we've started allocating things and placing things around. Um, we, obviously, the green space is very important and the green space is our key. So they're, they're 
key spaces. We've also got some commercial space. Now, the reason we've placed that along the front is that it faces onto commercial road and nobody is going to want a flat or a house which faces directly onto commercial road at ground. So that naturally means it should be, it makes a good space for commercial use. To the left hand side, going down towards Stepneys, this is where we're thinking of grouping some of the community uses together. And on the right hand side, this is where we've grouped the what we the doctor's surgery, the nursery, the pharmacy, and the recreation facilities in what we're calling a wellness facility. So everything which is sort of linked that way joins together in one area to become a very bespoke wellness facility and recreation area. So that's a sort of general layout of the areas that we've been looking at where we think things might go. Okay, right. This is based on what we've learned over the year, isn't it? It's quite evident from these two diagrams. The first one is where shouldn't we build on the site? And it's obvious we shouldn't be building where there's green spaces. The green spaces are really important, so we shouldn't be building on those. And as a foil to that, on the right hand side, okay, that leaves us with these spaces where we've got areas where we can potentially build. Uh, we've got a little area next to. Um, Stepneys, which only would be appropriate for a very small scale building respecting um, um, Stepneys. And then we have two other buildings, three other buildings next door to the telephone exchange, <coughs> one in Brayford Square, and the other block in where the Mooga is currently located. So you can see that by thinking about how important the green space is, we've given ourselves an sort of area that might be possible to develop. Okay. Right. As a lot of the work that we've done over the last year has been talking about landscape and the, the, how, how we deal with the space. And that it might seem strange for us to talk a lot about that, but really it's fundamental for this project and the design is for two reasons. One, we've got to make sure that any new building that we put on the or buildings that we put on the site fit into the site and are integrated and secondly it's a sort of fundamental thing that the landscape is so important to everybody let's make sure every single inch of the site is used to its absolute maximum so we can create in the green the large green courtyard at the top a much better green space with much more planting we can start creating smaller pocket gardens which perhaps maybe have quieter areas seating in them things like that potentially for a peace garden and even maybe some allotments something like that so the space starts getting used and it has something which can appeal to everybody um, of different age groups and obviously a central court within the middle which is a new focus for the landscape but as I said, one of the fundamentals of what we're doing is to ensure that all the landscape is open to everybody. It's not just for the new residents, it's for everybody. Okay. And then we'll just talk very quickly about blocks and heights. So I'll just run through this quite quickly because this is where we're getting to at the moment. Having spoken to everybody, we're now starting to work out how big the buildings should be, where they should go, and how can we put them on the site, which is going to have least impact for everybody, which is really important to us. Each of these three diagrams you're seeing on the screen here all contain approximately 250 flats units. And we just want to show you how different ways that we can put them on the site. The first option at the top just has three very large blocks placed along the front of Commercial Road. Now this for the existing site, this is great. It has quite a little impact on everybody on the existing site, and it helps to preserve as much of the green space as possible. But obviously the downside of this is that you're gonna get quite large, potentially, well, very large buildings facing onto commercial road, which don't really respect the existing architecture and don't doesn't really fit in. So even though that's a, it's like a simplistic approach, it's not really a very responsible approach. So the second option starts looking at, OK, let's start looking at the shapes of the buildings and the heights of the buildings. And perhaps we can play around with the heights, making tall bits, lower points that start respecting the existing buildings and enable us to make sure that we can pull buildings away from the existing buildings 
making sure that the existing buildings aren't overshadowed because we've got to ensure that that doesn't happen <clears throat> and excuse me as we work through the designs we will be spending a lot of time to make sure that any buildings we put on the site don't overshadow the existing buildings and in no way sort of detrimental to the quality of life of the uh, existing residents so the second building shows a high point within the center of the site which okay that's great because it takes the height away from the main uh, commercial road which is a benefit but potentially that's not a great thing for the existing site because it's going to start casting shadows and we you know we look at these things and then we sort of put them to one side so the third option is where we've moved the high point to commercial road and at that point this building has the least impact on any residents currently on the site and this is where we are at the moment we're doing lots of exercises trying to work out where is where can we put the buildings with the least impact and this is where we're getting to at the moment okay so we move on and i just want to quickly just give you some examples of things that we, we sort of look at um, and things which are really important to us and things that we these are examples some of our examples of our other projects where we on the left hand side how we deal with landscape and integrate our buildings um, together and as you can see landscape as i've gone on quite a lot about is really important to us and then the second one is you know how do you deal with walkways and balconies i think a lot of people have you know quite strong ideas about when you talk about things like this but actually there's really uh, ways that you can make them really um, attractive and useful to people and we've done a lot of schemes like this where they've been very successful and finally um, in terms of we're just beginning to think about materials but I think we all know or we all hope that this is going to be a brick collection of buildings because houses should be made of brick it's it feels right but also at the same time brick doesn't necessarily need to be plain and boring we can make sure that we can <laughs> create patterns interesting brickwork so there's lots of things we can do with the brick to make it interesting and so this is another one of our projects where we started to work with brick quite a lot okay and then finally just to give you an idea of how we work and how we go about these things um, these are sketches these are just purely indicative views but what i want to just talk about is how we go about placing the buildings on the site what we do is when we've talked about massing we sketch it out we model it to see how these things actually sit in the street because particularly if we look at number one it's important to understand how any new building is going to sit against stepneys sit against the church on the other side of the road and we've got to make sure that we get these relationships right so these are just work in progress where we're showing you this is our working method we model everything and we test everything so when we come up with the final proposals later in the year hopefully um, we can make sure that the scheme sits on the site as cohesively and respects all the surrounding buildings as, as much as possible okay i think that's it for me so hopefully um, if anybody's got any questions thanks uh thank you mark there is one question that came in while you were talking it goes back pretty much to the beginning of your presentation i think yep. you were talking about the consultation that took place in february and yep. you on to the site you mentioned a figure of 77 percent of residents agreeing or strongly agreeing uh, i think it was I, I i can jump in on that the the figure came from the last public exhibition um it's from the feedback from the public exhibition which was um, yes, yeah, attended by 126 individuals. Okay, so that would be 90 out of 100. I think it's 85 percent. Um, just highlighted it just, just down here. Helps. Okay, I think the point the person's making is yes, that 77 percent of the people who attend, if you like, 77 percent of residents who attended not 77 percent of all residents on the estate oh i see what well, yeah yeah that's correct yeah okay and they uh, and now that's clarified i mean a, a follow-up question from them about building new homes um i'll read it out in, in person shall i do you think building brand new homes around old buildings that are falling apart will have any effect on the mental health of the current residents if i don't know if you need more clarification on that so um 
Well, I think that our proposals are looking uh, specifically, uh, you know, at the community space and the green areas. The the new build um, will be of a higher quality, just in the nature that it's new, as opposed to um, the current estate, which is 40 to 50 years old now. Um, but some of the services that we're going to be putting in there in the wellness centre and the, the reprovided services are only ever going to improve the um, community and the lives of, of the residents when they're completed um, in the same way that, you know, the new buildings will be a positive thing for the estate. Um, I, I think I, I would like to say that um, I don't feel that, um, you know, referring to the current estate as falling apart is quite correct. Um, I'm sure, obviously, there are elements of the estate that, that need works done on them, as in any estate that's 40 or 50 years old. And in the kind of what was referred to as the maintenance program, the cyclical maintenance, they'll be addressed. Um, one of the things that we've said we would like to do is put aside an amount of money, uh, a pot of money um, from the development that will be able to be spent on the current existing estate. So, um, and that's something that we need to be asking residents um, exactly um, where they think that should be spent. That's outside of the general work that will be done um, and levied upon um, people's service charges. So it, it's a separate pot of money. And things that spring to mind are, uh, for example, the entrance um, and lobby uh, areas that could do with a, a complete upgrade, stair stairwell, staircases, um, some of the uh, screens on the side, which I believe are perspex that could be redone as as, as glass, for example, are stuff that um, you know would would be quite expensive. It had to be levied upon service charges, but we could use the pot of money to look at those sort of things, as well as things like lighting in hallways and and decoration, um, so flooring, so that sort of thing in in communal hallways. But I think that the potential of um, the new development should be a positive, and I'd hope to. That it doesn't have um, a negative effect um, on people's mental health. Right. I think I'll read this out again in, in, in person, if that's okay. The document, that, that's, I would say, your presentation, I think, says um, the heights will range up to 13 or 15 or 17 floors. Uh, it's a huge range. What's the current thinking on the high point in option three? In other words, I guess, how high will it go? OK, um, now th th this is a little bit tricky to explain. Um, I just want to check everybody can hear me. I'm back, aren't I? Yeah. Um, we, as I was explaining, we look, we're looking at how we create um, the, the general layout of the site anyway. And the things that obviously, the taller the building goes, if we have a high point, the lower the rest of the buildings can go. And so it's a question of um, modelling the building and testing it out. Now, we, I honestly, because we haven't got the final design and we haven't tested the final layouts, um, the actual final height of the building hasn't been um, agreed at the moment. And yes, we are looking within a range of heights, um, but that does depend on how we um, lay out the rest of the sites and perhaps you know like I say these aren't final options at the moment and um, perhaps as we move forward the the high point at that the, those heights might not necessarily be um, the right idea and so as we work through um, this is going to come out so what the, these three images were just really just showing you the approach to how we can deal with it you know it's quite straightforward if you have high bits then you can lower the rest of the site um, or the rest of it has to come up slightly to enable the high points to come down. And this is the work we're doing at the moment to work this out. Um, I obviously understand there's a natural, um, people have a natural reservation against um, tall buildings and that is completely understandable like most people do. So we are thinking about ways that we can re um, provide or remodel the building to lessen the, the impact of the high points. So we, we're looking at that at the moment. So just to check before I move on, just this yeah, yeah. does that mean yeah. one of the things you would like from consultation would be residents' views on heights of buildings and... Yeah, well, we, we spoke with um, the resident steering group. Uh, we had a session with them on heights as well, where we went through this, this whole process in detail as well about how we deal with heights in 
um, modeling and moving things around on the site and how we can get the building because obviously the buildings have to sit in context as well there's surrounding buildings that they need to sit with um, carefully and so these are the things that we've got to work out quite carefully is okay we're looking to get this number of units on the site which actually for a site this big isn't that high we're not over it by any stretch we're not over developing the site we're okay. quite actually being quite respectful in terms of what we could possibly get on that site so like I said we're just looking at the moment and uh, you know we're, we're actively looking to reduce the high points at the moment as well and how okay. we deal with that okay right, thank you in that case um yeah I think uh, Jeremy you want to come in don't you on heights as well yeah, yeah, because I think that um, obviously we've only um, been able to take certain portions um, of the story so far document that we sent out to everybody and all the residents. And so there's a little bit more in there, which sort of explains why there is such a range. And it's because we have looked at um, what is appropriate within planning regulation within the borough in the locality. Um, and there was a picture with some sort of coloured houses on top of each other um, in, in one of the other um, slides that it was, it wasn't on this presentation, it was part of the story so far document. And it showed some of the other developments, um, some very, very close to the site, some a few hundred metres, uh, you know, four or 500 metres away. And what it showed that was the densities were, were, were much, much, much more dense than what we're considering at the moment. So if we looked at the policy, we could be looking up to 350 homes which is not what we're doing, but we were just saying that this is what the site um, potentially could take. And, and the more homes that you put, the higher the heights go. And that's kind of where that tall point of 17 stories came, came from. When you're looking back towards the 250 homes, it is a lower point. And as Mark said, we'll be working through these heights with, with you, the residents in the community, with the local authority and the planners, including with the GLA as well. Um, and, and at some point, we'll hopefully have a balance where everyone feels more comfortable with them. So. Um, I, I don't envisage that 17 stories or even 15 stories is going to be a high point. I think it will be lower than that. Yeah, I would tend to agree. And the other thing in, in when we go start mod modeling this and looking at this in much more detail, obviously the thing which is really important in placing buildings on this site <laughs> is to mitigate any impact they're going to have on the existing um, existing people's homes on the site so we've got to be very careful where we place these buildings and obviously we do lots of studies with overshadowing how that's going to impact on people and what can we do to the shapes of the buildings to make sure this doesn't happen so this is the stage we're at at the moment where we have to really carefully test the shapes and the forms and the heights to make sure that it's going to have very little impact or the minimum amount of impact on the existing um, site as it sits at the moment. Okay, the next question might be one for Greg um, to answer. It's, a, it's um, whether the pot of money that Swan are committing to invest on the estate is in addition to the compulsory community infrastructure levy that the council would expect on any new redevelopment. That, addition, that money would be in addition to the community infrastructure levy um, and, and if, any liability that one need to pay in relation to the community infrastructure levy. Okay, so, so that's extra money on, on yeah. top. Next question is, is there a quote, do nothing option on green space behind Brayford Square? Also, do you have results of a tree survey yet? Because the trees are very special. Firstly, I, I can, um, Jeremy, you can come in as well on this one, but um, from our side as you know looking at the site overall I think that it would be I think it's so fundamental to the overall success of any new project and integrating it with the existing um, scheme that yeah we have to do something to the green spaces I don't I, I don't think we've ever considered there's a do nothing option from our side um, on that uh, because it's it's really important because the green spaces aren't necessarily um, benefiting everybody at the moment you've got a lot of green spaces um, as for the tree surveys I surveys that work is still ongoing and obviously that's something which we have to do and we will be doing and like I said before we uh, we understand completely how important those trees are 
and it's we're going to do everything to work with the existing trees on the site because it's it would be a real shame to start removing the trees but like i said there might be the odd occasion where one or two have to be moved but if that happens then we our strategy will be to re-provide with mature planting and probably hopefully this is within our landscape strategy that we're starting to put forward or develop ourselves is that we would expect there to be a net gain with trees on the site overall anyway okay, okay. thank you yeah and and so i mean just to add to that i think that um i don't know um Patrick, if you could bring up the landscaping um view that that's it perfect um i think you should point out that in regards to do nothing we're actually looking at the big green space um that you refer to and making it bigger so um the current building line for brayford square pushes quite far north um up to where the we've put a pathway in. I mean, it's just an indicative pathway, a bit further up than that. Um, yeah, there. I mean, that's kind of the building uh, line, um, or at least the back end of the concrete um, and pathways behind the playgroup. Um, and so we're, we're increasing that space by probably 30 to 35%, if not more. Um, so I, I think, you know, yes, I suppose you could do nothing, but actually um, I think it'd be a, a massive improvement to that space and it's, and it's making it bigger as well. The next question, uh, half, half question, half, half statement perhaps, is for a follow-up from the person who asked about the poor condition of existing homes. Um, they're, they're mentioning problems like mould, damp, bad pipes, low water pressure, and, and asking the impact that they might have on mental health. Now, I realise that might be a maintenance, not a redevelopment issue, but they then ask, especially... Um, you know, if, if works aren't being done. So maybe it's that if your attention's focused on this, does that mean that you won't be? So um, yeah, on and ap this? apologies if I didn't answer the question the first time. Um, look, in the past, I've, I've worked with um, homeless and, and people with enduring mental health. So I, I, I really, really hope that um, what we're going to be doing here can only improve um, overall people's mental health. But I think it's quite a valid question. And I think it's something I'm going to take back and I'm going to speak with um, our resident involvement team um, and also our, our property maintenance and housing teams um, to, to try and understand um, if there's any interventions we can make um, when eventually building work starts to happen um, to, to look at cases and to work out if, um, you know, well, to, to mitigate and make sure people aren't suffering from what we're going to do. So I think it's a, it's a very valid question. And I think um, it's a difficult one for me to ask on the spot, but answer on the spot. But I think um, I definitely will we'll, we'll be taking that back and we'll be having a look into that for you. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay, the next question is on um, service charges for leaseholders. Um, and how and when any service charges, presumably coming out of the, the redevelopment, will be decided? Yeah, yeah. Um, another good question. I think that, um, again, somebody asked this to us yesterday. Uh, so for, from, from our perspective is that the um, works that I spoke to you about in regards to the extra pot of money um, won't cost uh, residents or leaseholders anything. And that the works we're doing, um, that we're proposing in regards to the new development, um, it's likely that because there'll be an introduction of, you know, 200, 250 new homes, um, they'll be contributing to the communal service charges um, of the green spaces, the landscape, landscaping spaces. And therefore, uh, we don't expect there to be an increase in service charges for these holders. In, in fact, we would hope that there would be some, um, you know, slight reduction. But until we have a full understanding um, of exactly what we're doing and in terms of sort of more finalised options towards the end of the year. Um, we won't be able to um, do those calculations, but we don't envision them to be increasing at all. Okay. So, question. So, so presumably towards the end of the year, that might be a question people could ask with some, 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 some sorts of um, expectations that there'll be something that might yes. give them a steer. Okay. Next question about the George Tavern and how light to the tavern will be protected. I think this is probably in light of the um, wellness centre building. That well, shall I jump in on this one? Um, obviously, we're very aware of 
the George and the, um, the size it is and where the windows are. Obviously, anything that when we start looking at any potential development on the site next door, we have to be absolutely sort of cognizant of the existing architecture. And like we've already said, that we, we sort of feel that if any development there is obviously going to be a relatively small scale, but we do have to maintain, there's some fundamental things that we have to do, and that is to maintain rights of light to the windows as it is at the moment. And so obviously as the scheme goes forward, we'll be um, working with a sunlight consultant who will be employed to check this to make sure that anything that we do isn't detrimental to um, the light in the George. That's something that we have to work with. And it's important to how that will inform any design for the, if we, we develop part of the site next door. Question is if there'll be a public vote uh, on the final design, and I guess by public vote that might be a resident ballot, particularly rather than the wider area, but, um, but essentially any plans for a vote? Um, hi, yes, and, and this came up at the steering group and has come up before. I think, Ian, you actually answered it um, quite well mm -hmm. at the steering group. Um, no, there is no plans for there to be a ballot and there is no plans to be a vote. Um, we will be working through the designs, um, coming up with an option, um, and we'll be presenting it to residents for feedback um, prior to us putting it in for a planning application early next year. So no, the, the answer to that is okay. no. And I'm not sure, but... Um, but Sam, do you want to come in here, or is that perhaps not? It's, um, it's just yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can do just um, yeah, just just echo just what. Right. Sorry, just just echo what Jeremy said. Obviously, um, there'll still be in further rounds of consultation as we further develop the proposals, um, and also any any and all feedback that comes out of the consultation we're doing um, this month. Obviously, all feeds into the design process. Um, everything we receive gets passed on to the project team much wider um, and we, we go from there as, as the design process carries on. Okay, next question. Right. Okay, the, the next question is, what's the time scale from commencement of works to the finished, finished time or finished date? So that's upon the planning time frames and then Swan could probably come in and clarify the construction time frames. Yep, fine by me Greg. Yeah, in terms of planning, um, as Sam just touched upon, we're hoping to have a uh, planning to have a further public consultation um, towards the end of the year, highly likely to be in November, um, where we can then show further uh, proposals of a preferred option that we'd like to submit for planning, get feedback on that, with a view then to submitting a planning application um, early next early next year, hopefully in January. Um, and it's likely for a scheme of this scale um, to take about six months for the application to be determined. So um, by the summer of 2021, we hope to have secured planning permission um, for the project. Um, and then there'll be a, pro a process of SWAN uh, preparing and mobilising before start on site um, early in 2022. Um, Jeremy, can you come in and clarify how long you think construction would take? Yeah, um, well, some of that will depend on phasing of the site and obviously what we end up, um, you know, getting via the planning and the consultation process in terms of the blocks and the forms. But yes, um, early 2022 to the start on site. And then PC date, you know, a scheme like this, uh, 250 homes will be three to four years, um, I, would, I would have thought. And I think as we get later through the year and we start um, focusing in on a particular um, option, we'll be able to have um, more clarity on that and we'll be issuing much more information in, in in response to kind of construction plans and how we plan to mitigate any disruption to the current residents on the estate. Okay. So Greg, did you want to add anything to the time scale question after that? Uh, I mean, I think it was to try and give an approximate finish date, an end date. Of the works. Well, I, I think at the moment it will be difficult really. to answer that one, Ian. Okay. I'm afraid. Okay. That's I think as we, as we, as as the moment we've we've shown 
three kind of options that we're going to be working through once we've had feedback, working through that with the local authority um, and community stakeholders and residents. As we develop um, towards that final option, we'll be able to understand more and then we'll be able to give people some more clarity on timescales, I think. Okay, thank you. The next question is about the um, crane that collapsed on, on, on one of Swan's sites in Bow recently. Um, they, I mean, there's certainly a, an external investigation going on. I dare say you've been looking internally as well. The question is, will the findings and the recommendations be reported back to Exmouth residents? And, and presumably there's a sort of, sort of additional thing they haven't typed there, perhaps before work starts on site. I don't know who could take that. Hilary, uh, are you there? Hi there, yes, I'm here. Um, of course, um, we're all absolutely devastated um, with what's happened at Watts Grove and we realise it's impacted on Exmouth um, already because as a mark of respect, we stopped work um, on all of our projects um, in the immediate aftermath of this. Um, the site is in the hands of the Health and Safety Executive and we will support um, a very full and thorough investigation, um, which will, of course, um, be reported very widely. So there will be no doubt um, that you will certainly um, have, have sight of, of, of what comes out at the end of that. Um, we don't have a timeline on it and really just to reiterate that we're doing everything we can to support the findings and to have some sort of conclusion to, to really what's been a really tragic and dreadful um, incident. So I, I haven't got any more to update you at the moment. Um, that's, that's where we are with it. Thank okay. you. Okay, the next question concerns the homes that will would be demolished under all three options, um, sort of at, at the front of Brayford Square on Commercial Road. And it specifically concerns the leaseholders, but I realise tenants are, are, are living there as well. Um, it says, because leaseholders are under a threat of a compulsory purchase order, is it possible to withdraw that threat hanging over them during the COVID-19 pandemic? because it's additional enormous stress and worry. Yeah, um, I think that we're obviously very conscious at the moment how difficult life is for a lot of people under um, you know, the government restriction of COVID-19 and the impact it has on people's lives. Um, we're obviously mindful of the residents and the tenants um, and the leaseholders on Brayford Square who are directly affected um, by these proposals and hence working you know, as hard as we can with those residents to seek out options, um, you know, long before um, any CPO discussions would take place. Just to be clear that um, Swan Housing can't do, uh, that they have no jurisdiction over a CPO, that that's something that the local authority will, will decide on. Um, so that's not something that, that we can, or we have the gift to take or, or give. Um, but certainly we're hoping that, you know, we can come to compromises and, and negotiations with all affected residents and leaseholders um, of those those homes. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add, and this is not based on Tower Hamlet's policy, this is national policy, is you couldn't have a, a CPO compulsory purchase order until you had planning permission anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's just a, a little fact I've thrown in there. Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean people aren't concerned about it if planning permission is granted, obviously. So it's not in force now to be withdrawn, but it's something that could be applied for in the future. Okay, the next question is about the tall building. Oh, well, I, I know we've talked about heights possibly varying, but um, whether a tall building, perhaps 17 storeys, would respect St. Mary and St. Michael Church on the other side of the road. Um, the parish church, sorry, the parish priest is completely against it. Um, the question says, do we need a Grenfell Tower? type of block in the middle of the Exmouth estate or perhaps even on the edge I suppose I'll add. Okay I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, obviously as, as we talked about earlier um, we're working through the heights at the moment as, as Jeremy pointed out it's the 17 stories was based on 
a much greater number of um, residential units on that site anyway so we're coming down from that and yeah we are hoping to reduce the height of the building quite considerably um in terms of the idea of it being anything like the Grenfell Tower that obviously is not at all what we're not at all um, thinking about um and one of the things which we're doing a lot of work at, at the moment and throughout the whole pro our design process is to get an understanding of the area and to get an understanding of the context, the buildings nearby, the history of those buildings and how important those buildings are. And this all informs where we place the buildings on our site. Because yes, we have to completely understand that the church is a very important building. And I would agree that a 17 storey tower nearby is absolutely inappropriate and we're not proposing that um, we're looking at how we can deal with height in other places on the site and so like I said these were options that we were exploring and the 17 storey option was based on a much higher figure and we're looking you know different ways we can do it but as we talk about the context the surrounding context is something that does inform what we're doing on the site Okay. okay, a couple more questions in at a moment. The first one is a follow up to the earlier question on light being protected to the George Tavern. Okay, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a bit of a, an update saying there's art exhibitions. Yeah, above. I, 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 and, and I, I, I understand that completely. And yeah, I know, I, I realise that the, the light to the upper floors of the, the George is really important. And like I, I was saying earlier, that we have to be completely cognizant of that fact. And any proposal any that we put put on um, Stepney's site has to completely understand how the George is being used at the moment. And so anything that we put on that site isn't detrimental to how it's used. And so, you know, we're exploring quite relatively small buildings on that site, which aren't going to impact on the George as it stands at the moment, because that's something that we don't want to happen. And obviously to, to provide some sort of reassurance on this, as we were saying earlier, we will be testing that and ensuring that the rights to light to the existing spaces within the George is maintained. And that's something that gets tested by a consultant, um, a sunlight consultant, rights to light consultant throughout the project. And okay. so we are very aware of that fact. And it is going to something that we are taking on board with any design that goes near the George. We, we understand that completely. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question myself? Because, I mean, I'm very aware simply because I see lots of regeneration schemes of how a design is a long, drawn-out process and not all the answers can come up at once. I noticed Greg said there'll be a preferred option, hopefully, by November. Does that mean that you'd be in a position to do a, a sunlight and daylight survey then? And have some no, that, that's something that we have to do relatively quite quickly because we need to any when we show our preferred option later in the year we will have had to have tested this because it's it's in a way there's no point us presenting an option which hasn't been tested um because we need to make sure that all the issues that we've been talking about any impact it, it might have on the existing buildings is mitigated and there's things that we might have to do to the form of the building to change that if you see what i mean so we have we need this is stuff which is informing the work as we speak Okay, thank you. And the final question that's showing at the moment is from someone who says, I sent questions that had no response. I'm hoping that's not today. I'm, I'm hoping that's in the past. Um, that they've not been able to get onto the steering group. That's the resident group that has been advising you on, on, on the designs as they've progressed. And that they're not reassured by the lack of a vote or the ballot. Now, I don't know if anyone can answer that now, but again, because I can see the name, I don't know if it's something someone might get back on, but I'll, I'll over to Swan if they think there's something to address now or outside the meeting. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I mean, uh, it's just about this steering group, I and mean, I believe it's like one of the earlier meetings uh, on the steering group did agree to kind of take some more members as well. So um, I believe, you know, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's not too late. I mean, although we are not having the face-to-face -face meetings, but, you know, I mean, if I can type my email address, and then if you can send your details, like, you know, I mean, we are more than happy to include you as part of the steering group, is all you need to do basically just send, as we'll send you a terms of reference, and you just assign it and send back to us. So I don't think it's to be a problem to kind of join the steering group now. I mean, 
Okay, so, so you're interested. So, uh, Abdullah, I mean, that's, that, that sounds like a general invitation to residents. I mean, I have to say for people who aren't on the estate, that, that wouldn't apply because it's a resident steering group. But for those yeah. people in the estate, there are places. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay. I, um, in addition, I think that at the start of the process, um, we went out extensively um, and we had about 15 responses and uh, through time, um, a few people have been unable to attend um, as regularly as they may have wanted or due to family commitments and work commitments haven't been able to attend. So there have been a couple of spaces um, that, have, uh, that, that we are able to fill. Obviously, with the COVID-19 situation, it has slowed some, somewhat down. But Yes, absolutely. As Abdullah said, there, there is space for um, residents, so we will absolutely uh, look into that if that's something that you'd like to do. Um, and I think you should be able to. Um, th th I think I think now there is enough ways to communicate. I'm, I will definitely look into some of the questions that, that have been sent and as to why they haven't um, come through to us, because I know that myself and Sean Kelly have been um, inundated with a lot of letters and questions, and we have been responding to them. So we'll, we'll look into that, hopefully. Not something we can do right now, but um, if you can communicate with us um, after the session, we'll, we'll look into that for you. Okay, and if I can just add, because rather like chairing these meetings, I have a resident steering group, I, I, I think the more people, the better, within reason. There are places and it won't become unwieldy if we have a few more people join. Sorry, I think I was cutting across someone there. No, I, I was just going to say on a, on a more general point, Ian, um, obviously there's still an extensive amount of consultation we'll be doing with residents um, all the way up until um, see what the submission of planning application and pretty well beyond that as well. Um, so there'll still be plenty of opportunity for any residents or any interested parties to, to take part and, and provide feedback on, on the emerging proposals. And, and the more feedback we receive now, um, ahead of the finalization of any of any concrete proposals the better um so i would just encourage everyone to to continue to provide feedback as much as possible someone's asked where the resident steering group is on the residence charter now i know that there's that this is something that some people want some people don't want but um caroline is there any update on that i know before the pandemic struck there were plans to set up a working group. Uh, Caroline is not there, so you know, oh, I can answer her. Yeah, so on her behalf. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thank yeah, you. we had like, one session like, with residents. I mean, it was uh, sort of one of these earlier meetings earlier this year. And basically, we had about sort of an hour sort of meeting prior to the main meeting. And then, you know, we had this sort of like, you know, sort of like, a, sort of like all the lockdown and stuff. So therefore, it didn't progress much. Uh, the finding from you know, just one meeting still with Caroline, and basically, you know, I mean, we are still working on it at the moment, and hopefully, I mean, I will check with Caroline tomorrow about, like, you know, about the time scale that we can publish the, you know, or the sort of future work program in terms of the resident charter. But certainly, we'll come back to you on that. Okay, so is this perhaps an item that could be addressed in the next resident steering group meeting? Just an yeah. update. Yes. Absolutely, I think um, we're, we're something that will be added to the agenda and it can be discussed yeah. uh, amongst the group um, with a, uh, an issuance of uh, the, the work so far that's been done on it, because um, it is quite okay. important. And uh, as, as you mentioned, there are some um, residents who aren't as keen on it, but it's something that we think is very important. Mm -hmm. I suppose I ought to explain for people on the residence steering group, a residence charter is like a, a sort of list of guarantees, a list of protections that gets developed often early on in a regeneration proposal, addressing some of the concerns that people are raising. Can't, can't address all of them, but it can give some protection on rights if people have to move or disturbance. And, and so even though the final plans aren't ready, there might be some ground rules that can be set down on how, if any redevelopment goes ahead, res existing residents would be protected. I think, as Abdullah alluded to, in an ideal world, um, we would have continued with our face-to-face -face, um, sessions to discuss that, um, and it just hasn't quite happened over the last month. But it's certainly something that we'd like to be um, agreeing so sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. 
is just to reiterate, we have the four sort of members from the steering group I mean, who had joined this, this sort of working group for the resident charter. If anybody you know, sort of else would like to join the like, charter working group, more than welcome. But you know, as Jeremy said, this will be part of the discussion uh, I mean, at the next steering group meeting. But it is sort of more than sort of welcome to, kind of, to have this representation from like, any other members or any comments about the charter as well. Okay, is asking for more details about the wellness centre for the GP surgery and the pharmacy. I'm happy to um, <clears throat> take that question if, if okay. for the time being. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy uh, Arnold from Swan. Um, so, yes, uh, the wellness centre. Um, we're, we're working on that at the moment. As you can see um, on the site plan, thanks, guys, um, in yellow uh, on the site, which is to the east of the site, um, just around about Summer Court Road. In in that um, block there that we're starting to look at, we feel that this is a good area um, to focus on um, the wellness centre. And it will be looking and working, hopefully, with um, the pharmacy, who I can see are uh, represented here today, um, also the GP surgery, looking at um, a community use centre on, on that element of the site, um, and as well as looking at a reprovided uh, games area. So we've got the basketball court where we're proposing that this block will go on. And so we're looking at incorporating that within into the building um, to uh, sort of really um, bring in a kind of state of the art uh, astro kind of turf feel that can be used for multiple um, sports, not, not specifically for football. It could be walking football for the over 50s. It could be bowls. Um, it could be netball and there really is um, a plethora of, of uses for that um, and also to take in the management of that function because I know at the moment um, you know the, the basketball court is, is probably not as well used uh, from residents on the estate um, and there have been a lot of antisocial um, complaints about um, sort of older youths from off the estate congregating later in the evenings um, so that's something that we want to make sure that we kind of bring it back for the use of the local community so and, and that around uh, the wellness function. So that, that's what we're looking at um, when, we, when we say uh, a wellness centre. Okay. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Um, all information about the proposed community spaces and uses, um, whether people on, on the team have been liaising with community groups on what spaces could be used for. Now you started answering that in your last question I think Jeremy a bit. Yeah um, and I, I'll say a little bit on this. I'm, I'm happy also I think we've got Caroline um, Richardson on the call who um, is our community uh, resident involvement coordinator. Um, so we, we've started to have conversations with social enterprises and specifically Social Enterprise UK um, to see what there is locally um, in the area and also to understand what need is and um, to see if we can work with some social enterprises to utilize some of that um, community space. Um, again, looking at um, <clears throat> some of the groups, well, we, we, we're in discussions at the moment. And I think as the space forms, as uh, the physical space forms, as we move through these consultations with you, the community and the residents, um, we'll start to understand um, how we can best use those so there's been no decisions at the moment um, and we're apart from that anything that could relate to wellness um, and probably to you know the usual things of youth involvement um, and you know working uh, to you know increase job opportunities and training those are the kind of things we'll probably be um, considering for that space but nothing has been decided as yet. Next question is about how antisocial behaviour could be prevented on the new green spaces especially if they're hidden away from commercial road by the buildings along the front, the large blocks. I if that's one for Mark or... Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, what, can everybody hear me? I'm, am I back? Just double checking if you can see me. Um, yeah, what we've found, we, we, we have a, a lot of our estate regenerations have exactly the same problem with estates are designed or previously been designed with areas which are badly observed where people can, you know, you've got niche areas where people can hide away and get up to antisocial behaviour. There's not clear views across the site. Um, so I think there's some sort of fundamental key principles that you start using when you design um, a new landscape. And that's one of the things is if a space is overlooked, that spaces tend to be more secure. And that, that isn't, that's just 
a sort of a fact that if people think they're being watched, antisocial behaviour um, opportunities for it start to diminish quite a lot. And so that's one of the, the sort of fundamental principles we do is to make sure that our spaces are overlooked. We don't create areas where people can loiter or hide away, that, that type of thing. And the other thing is the use of planting. Planting plays a really important role in this, in creating um, not spaces where people can hide away, but places which um, form buffers and protect um, what, the, what we call defensible space, really. It's where you use planting to um, make sure that people can't get into new buildings. Um, and so it's a sort of series of devices like that that you use. So actually what you end up with is you end up with a, a very beautiful landscape, but actually it's much more secure. And so it's sort of embedded into the design from um, day one. Um, and there's things, for instance, if you've got balconies overlooking a courtyard, people tend to stand on their balconies and look out. And therefore, anti people loitering in that courtyard, it just doesn't happen. And there, there's very simple things as well. All big landscape projects like this need to be properly lit. So we don't create dark little spaces. And so there's some sort of... It's, it's, there's some sort of fundamental principles that you use to make sure that um, antisocial behaviour is designed out and it's sort of quite tried and tested, really. Does that answer that? Hopefully, but if the person's got any more questions or anyone listening to it, if, if they type in the q and I'll pass it to, to Mark. Um, the next question is, how many floors are there like to be in the MUGA building? That's the um, multi-use games area building assuming there's 250 new homes in the scheme. The person asking is concerned that they, there might be a lack of light in the buildings, if you yeah. like, behind them on the, behind it on the estate. Um, obviously, we have to ensure that, that we don't cause overshadowing onto existing buildings. And that, that's an exercise that we go through, or we're going through at the moment, in the way we're looking at the massing. And as I was sort of explaining earlier, we're doing lots of work at the moment of raising one building up or low and one building down to work out where the best place is to put the height. So I can't actually give an answer, a finite answer, as to how tall that building is going to be. But I would, as a degree of reassurance, that we have to be exceptionally careful to make sure that these buildings don't overshadow or uh, in any way detrimental to the light that the existing re um, residents are I mean, they, they have at the moment. That's something we've just got to be very, very careful about. And we work through that quite carefully in the way that we model the building going forward. Was there anything additional on the antisocial behaviour? Because if not, I haven't. If not, given we've now, I think, moved into the general consultation rather than the design to some extent, can I come back to the earlier question about partnership working with particularly the Georgia question was about, but um, there's, a, there's a point made that, to, um, although obviously the design is about providing new homes and, and you know, estate services, there's also the question of how it will impact on surrounding businesses. But the particular concern is about the George Tavern, which is, you know, a popular music venue, as you know, and uh, yes, I'm <clears throat> happy to, um, to to attempt to answer that in some part. Um, absolutely. Um, look, you know, the, the George Tavern um, has been there um, for 500 odd years and is a grade listed building. So um, we have to absolutely respect, um, you know, how it sits um, physically, but also how it's utilised within the community and also the wider, um, you know, East London and London as you know, a live music venue that um, they're, they're few and far between, especially now um, we're, we're in a COVID-19 world and venues like that need to be supported. But we are very conscious um, of how um, our ownership of part of the site, namely Stepney's um, and the Orwood Street um, block, um, you know, sits and progresses next to the George um, and making sure that we don't do anything that would damage, um, you know, not, not so much structurally, that that's obvious, but, you know, um, the business model um, of the George Tavern. Um, and so this is why that we, we are looking on that site um, to do a community use. Um, we, we, we have visions of looking at some sort of arts uh, centre, um, um, a, a community use centre, a cultural centre, 
Um, obviously, we have to be mindful of the design. Um, we know that the George isn't just used for um, you know uh, live music, but the upper floors are used um, for for other things like exhibiting um, and photography. Um, filming so that's something to be mindful of but we're confident that um, with the help of the architect and also um, bringing on heritage consultants working alongside um, you know the George that we can find a solution um, that, that benefits everybody. Um, we, we've been talking to a few charities about looking at the space and what we can do um, and that they're in their infancy. Um, some of those conversations have been um, helped by um, the GLA, uh, specifically the, the Mayor's Office and the Nighttime Czar, who have been helping um, us, and also, you know, with George to understand what could be done there. Um, I think the next part is to sit down um, and look at some plans, but we haven't been at that um, stage yet. Um, and also, to be fair, I think COVID-19 has been a difficult time for everybody, especially meeting. Um, so I'm hoping that you know, in the coming weeks, uh, we'll be able to start sitting down with the architects and the George. Um, and if there's any appropriate, um, uh, you know, services that want to, to sit in on that meeting. And I noticed someone here has mentioned, uh, you know, the UK charity Music Venue Trust. Um, then if that's, you know, that's something that the um, people at the George would like to do, then I think we're happy to, to have those meetings and those conversations. I hope that kind of covers uh, part of that question. If it does, there's a couple more have come in while that was on. Um, I mean, yes, just to let you know, the person who asked that would be very keen to follow up and be involved in these discussions. I, 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 I'm not giving names, but I'm making notes of people's details. So, so perhaps like, if I pass those on afterwards, that might be a question of following it up. Um, there is a question, um, at the moment, four of the open spaces, that's the green open spaces on the map, aren't open to all residents. I think this refers to some of them being fenced off and gated. Yeah. The question is, is this matter being addressed? By which? I think, I th I think that, um, and, and I've spoken um, to uh, the, the Exmouth Residents Board, um, and I've spoken, obviously, with the steering group, um, and, and I feel that there might be an opportunity um, for a couple of those spaces on Summer Court Road to be looked at. I know that they've been gated off in the past, um, you know, due to antisocial behaviour. And I know that um, they're considered to be kind of, you know, semi-private spaces for the residents who live in those blocks. And so I am mindful um, and I have been told, um, you know, by, by some of those residents that, you know, that they don't really want those gates removed. Um, but we feel that there might be an opportunity to re landscape those areas um, and have them opened up um, to the residents um, during certain times of the day. So, for example, 10 to 5, um, you know, something like that. Um, and that they could be looked at as a community garden, a, um, a peace garden, uh, maybe an opportunity to grow, um, you know, um, an allotment type um, area um, that could be looked at in conjunction with one of the social enterprises that we might be put into um, some of the community space there. I think that um, we've got some other existing uses. So I, I mentioned earlier before the Carer Centre, which is um, an amazing, um, you know, an amazing resource in the borough and in East London and, uh, you know, helps up, I think four and a half thousand uh, carers with respite um, services, um, which, you know, is amazing. And we were looking to work with them to sort of future proof, uh, you know, th their existence in the borough. Um, and I know that, you know, they would be interested in looking at uh, uh, some open space that could be used to the day. Um, and also we've got the, um, the nursery, the Bay Group, who again um, are quite important um, and would benefit with um, improved um, facilities that could also take advantage of some space. I don't by any means suggest like a playground, but I mean like, you know, a community, community growing garden or, um, you know, area. So I think that it's something we'd like to look at, but, you know, again, it has to be um, a, a wider discussion with those residents that sit around, um, you know, those those green areas and the wider estate. So it's something that, that we're open to, uh, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, something that will happen. We'll, we'll have to kind of see. Okay. Well, the, the next one is um, perhaps a more, a, 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 a more focused question it's whether um you've been in contact with local clinical commissioning group concerning yes, um, the GPC. so so town hamlets um and so you know to, to 
commendation to towns because they have um, a regeneration department um, for exactly um, estates and development like this and a lot of other local authorities don't and so they've been helping coordinate with the kind of decision makers in each um, of the uh, local authority and department so we've had meetings with the CCG and the NHS partners uh, we've had uh, initial discussions with uh, the GP surgery and the chemists um, and um, as we mentioned the, the carers centre and, and the playgroup all have some element of funding from the local authority um, and so we've been meeting with them and we've had several meetings and we're in regular contact and discussions about um, what the future holds um, for those services on this estate um, so absolutely yes that's really important um, we've been speaking also um, with the the town's office um, for sort of um, uh, business um, community nightlife for example to understand how um, you know the frontages and ground floor um, along commercial road can be dealt with in terms of retail uh, and commercial and community use and so that's been really some important meetings as well so yeah we're absolutely uh, making sure that uh, we're we're communicating and working with uh, those parts of the community and the next question is a follow-up to the early question on the um, fenced-off green spaces. Um, the, the questioner says, thanks for answering the question about the um, court greens, but what about the greens closer to the housing office? Um, right. So on the map, um, is, are these the areas where the cursor is just here? The ones that sit behind... Right. Okay, if they are those areas, um, we're not look so those areas are, as Mark had pointed out, um, we're not looking to, to build on, um, we're not looking to fence them off, um, but we will be looking to um, improve the quality of the landscaping around those areas, if that's the area that um, you're asking about, um, which was a question around the orange edged areas on the map. Um, one is the Holland site, which um, we, don't, we don't own. Um, we have had discussions um, with uh, the owners there who are looking to put their own um, planning permission in. Um, and we felt that it might be something that we could work with them or look to purchase the site, but so far that, that hasn't happened. Um, and the other is another few um, properties that we don't own further up the site as well. Um, so we just don't own those there, some houses um, owned by, I believe, another housing association. And another question has just come in about the green spaces. Are people looking to increase the diversity of the plants, for example? So, yeah, more so yes, just I mean, I can, I can answer that quickly and, and I'm sure that, um, you know, Mark might want to add in. I think this is a real opportunity for us to look at the species that we have um, on, on the estate. Um, we know that um, pollution is a, is a really big issue um, in London, but especially in this part of um, East London and along Commercial Road. Um, and that, you know, on estates, in a city estate such as this, people do tend to have uh, more issues with breathing and asthma. And so I think that there's a real opportunity for us to look at the planting. We're just in the, in, in the, in the moment, we're bringing on board a consultant um, to work with us on the landscaping and especially that um, biodiversity angle and looking at, you know, introduction of potentially green roofs and green walls um, and looking at how we can uh, bring in uh, insects and animals, um, you know, uh, you know, animal hotels, insect hotels, I think they're referred to as, and, and elements like that to really improve the biodiversity um, in and around the area and hopefully help with um, the, uh, you know, the air quality. Because if you think that some of the buildings will create a buffer um, to uh, commercial road, and then we can enhance that um, with planting. Um, so we're hoping that's a, a real, real improvement, not just at the moment, but to future generations um, on the estate. Can I just add in a little bit on, on that as well? Because uh, I, I, I think um, from our side, as designers on this project, that we, we think that the site is a really luxurious site in a way because you've got so much green space at the moment. And we sort of, the way we talk about, about the project itself, this is a landscape project. It's a, it's a really, it's a fundamental thing to this design is to get the building to work with any new landscape. And as I said er earlier, that it's, the particularly building in London, you have to make sure that every inch of every site it's being used to its best potential. And so we want to make sure, yeah, that we've got the best planting, the widest diversity of planting, which is right for that location. Because obviously we want to make sure that it's the correct planting. We won't, don't want to put planting in which um, won't, you know, survive in those type of conditions in, in harsh, well, basically net to main road conditions. Um, but also we always sort of make sure that our spaces are designed 
um, with maintenance in mind, because it's all very well designing a beautiful landscape garden for everybody. But if it's so hard to maintain and it falls into um, disrepair after a year, it's not going to be a benefit to anybody. So we want to make sure that the spaces that we create are almost self-regenerating in a way, that they get better and better and better with time and they don't decay down to, you know, like the picture we've got on the left, which is quite sad planted with trees in at the moment. We want to come back in 10 years' time and see this, this entire site blooming. And that, that's what the goal is. And we also want to make sure, and it, it's a good principle of design, to make sure that we've got an opportunity here, as Sam Jeremy was just saying, to use the buildings which face commercial road to positive, have a positive effect on the space behind and make that space the air cleaner, the air better, and a much better quality of space for everybody behind the buildings on commercial road. So in terms of the biodiversity and the landscape, this it's hopefully just going to improve everywhere immensely. That's that's what the you know the intention is. Next one in the Kuma is what um, how would you introduce a variety of design? into your scheme and they've mentioned the poundry yeah. effect which i think is the duke of yes uh, prince of wales <laughs> scheme yes. um the way every every scheme is different and every scheme um is a contextual response so what we do is we try and take find out and I get an understanding of the site, get an understanding of the history of the site, what's important on the site. Um, and this is what we call, you know, the site context. And looking at the, the buildings which are nearby and looking at the architecture they've got. So what we actually come up with is a very site specific type of architecture, which responds to the existing buildings, um, which makes reference to the local architecture. And I think by getting a sense of the local architecture and the history of this site and the perhaps some of the buildings which previously been on the site and the type of uses that can help us inform what the buildings look like and so we wouldn't anticipate all the buildings look the same we, we obviously you know you've got different buildings the buildings near stepneys it has a very different condition to the building next door to the telephone exchange and so the buildings aren't going to look the same but we we're trying to draw on the history of the site to give us a story that holds the whole thing together. So what we, when we present the final scheme, it's a very contextual response and responds to the, all the local architecture and fits in with it. Okay, I hope that answers question as a private space. You said a lot about the open spaces, but this question is whether any of the new flats will have their own outside space, for example, usable balconies. Yes, um, we have to provide amenity space for every residential unit. So the residential units not at ground will have balconies or potentially winter gardens and the units which are on ground will feature gardens and there'll be private amenity space for those. And so everybody gets some form of amenity space. Okay. Right. And the next question is, does the new development involve demolishing any of the neighbouring buildings or that, is it just limited to I'm the... I'm happy to take on that question, okay. Ian, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. That's um, Jeremy, isn't it? Right. Yeah, uh, Jeremy again. Um, so we pointed out the red line and we can see it there actually um, on the screen in front. Uh, there's no plans to be uh, looking at any land outside of that um, or outside of our ownership. There is um, the orange land which represents um, the old Exmouth Arms, um, Holland's Pub, which has been converted into some residential properties. Um, we, we have looked at that site, we have spoken with the owner of that site to see if there's any synergies. I believe that they are looking to put their own planning permission in for that space and it's something that we'd be more than interested to work with them to have a slightly more complete development. Um, but otherwise, we are um, only looking at space within our ownership within the red line. Okay. Right, our next question is whether you'd consider green walls and roofs on yes. this scheme. Um, yes, is the simple answer to that. Um, we, like I say, we think of this as a landscape project 
as a complete landscape project and so we would like to plant as many of the surfaces of the building as possible um, we would like to think that the majority of the roofs can be green roofs um, and we're looking at what we can do on the facade uh, the elevation of commercial road in terms of planting that because if we can get introduced planting high level planting onto commercial road that we effectively we can get the building to work almost as a filter which helps to reduce the pollution going into the, the green space behind so um, the use of green roofs and planting and vertical planting is something which is, yes, we're definitely exploring that and it's something which hopefully will be included in the scheme. Okay. Well, energy efficiency for, for the new homes. Um, we, yes, uh, we obviously want to design this to be the most uh, level, you know, cutting edge energy efficient building. And so that's something that we have to, um, go along with and that's something that obviously that we encourage um, we're looking to design the building what we call passive house principles um, which is all to do with how the building's orientated and how the building's constructed to make sure that the running costs of the building are as low as possible um, it's a sort of fundamental principle of modern housing design is that the buildings have to be energy efficient and this will be at the forefront of that. Um, I can't go into the exact details of how that's going to, without, you know, having worked through the scheme, but that's something which is embedded in the design from day one. And it's something which is sort of fundamental to the way the building um, is moves forward. Yeah. Can, I'm sorry. can I add some more to that, Ian? Is please, that okay? please, yes, please. Yeah, so I think also um, we're quite conscious about energy um, and heat and power. So that's something that we'll be looking at, um, looking at strategies such as um, air source uh, heat pumps, probably not ground source because of um, how the, the land lies here, um, district heat networks, stuff like that, um, to make sure we're efficient um, and also to save uh, ultimately money um, in the pocket of the residents moving forwards. Um, something else that obviously that we're looking to do on this site is modular housing, again in itself particularly efficient way of a building. So that's something that we'll be looking at, not necessarily for all of the blocks, because some don't lend themselves um, to do it that way, but certainly it's something that we're going to be doing and, and investigating as we move forwards. Okay, Thank, thanks Jeremy. Um, there's a question, um, I'll, I'll read it out word for word if that's okay, because um, I, I think the nuances may, may, may be helpful. I understand you have acquired everything in the red zone. I'm wondering if you consider that there to be any existing cultural or historical spaces that are to be sacrificed for the development. Um, I don't know if that means within the red zone, presumably. I think that the, the most, obviously, we're going to be working um, with the local community, the local authority, and also heritage consultants to make sure that um, any elements of, of heritage that we're respecting or at least working with. So I think the, the biggest one for us um, is the George Tavern, which is a grade two listed property, um, and it's been there for five, six hundred years. So that's something that um, we're very mindful of. Um, we're setting up We've had plenty of meetings so far um, and conversations with the George Tavern and the GLA have been um, helping us do that, in, especially in regards to um, the Mayor's Nighttime Czar. Um, so that, that's been quite important. And moving forward, we're going to be making sure that uh, we share plans, have discussions with the George Tavern to understand uh, the building that was um, Mark was referring to as Stepney's, which is our part of the site. Um, and at the moment, um, you know, we're, we're at the early stages of looking at that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely very conscious of the historical aspect of, Ste um, of Stepneys and the George Tavern. Okay. 